Christologies from the margins. What is Christology? One might ask, is it a, a journey of people and their faith and how Christology as a discipline within the theological examination comes to represent? What I hope to do in this particular lecture is to look at how we understand Jesus, how we perceive Jesus in different contexts. Is it a common Christian image that we are very often used to? Is it a, a product of various Christian movements? So the Gospels offer us as a developing narrative diverse images of Jesus Christ. But the key thing is distinguishing the Jesus of Nazareth and of course a remarkable human being who is captured in these Gospels and of course the risen living Christ who is one with God and the Divine Presence. And here we need to distinguish between history remembered and history metaphorized. The lens we use to look at Jesus Christ is very critical. The worldview within which we understand Jesus Christ provides us information and also details about how we understand this Jesus Christ. So we cannot escape the bodies we inhabit because it is through that we see and understand Jesus Christ. So combining history and faith is very critical how we shape our understanding of Jesus Christ. Christology in Christian theological tradition has always played an important role in the symbolic expression of cultural and religious understanding of a particular context. As a hermeneutical principle, Christology functions as a meaningful avenue to retell the life of Jesus Christ to various readers. And also Christology in this context from the margins, as I would like to offer, functions in a similar way. It contextually expresses the life of people in the margins through the paradigm of Jesus Christ. In other words, the purpose of Christology is to interpret the relevance of Jesus Christ in a perpetually excluded, subordinated and marginalized people's lives. It is also constructed to provide a liberative option to communities from an oppressed worldview and enable them to move towards a liberated life, an emancipated life. So Christology from the margins suggests that hybridity is located at the very center of the Christian faith. When I say hybridity, it means there are multiple ways of understanding Jesus Christ. It reminds us that the incarnation of the Christ, the divine and the eternal Logos, a word of God, was not confined to a point in time and a particular culture 2000 years ago, but is a continuous event. So incarnation indicates that the love of God for creation takes the risk of being born into human culture in a way that not only translates and negotiates with those cultures from the underside of human experience, but also itself translates and very often transcends those experiences. It is a risky and often, as theologians call it, a kenotic experience that self-empties itself, which will then lead to a very messy or blurred encounters and will potentially subvert the status quo but we'll always point towards the 
task of doing justice, pursuing fullness of life, inclusivity and reconciliation. Most often, as the Christian experience from the margins is shaped by their perceptions of Jesus, developing a very broad understanding of those contextual Christologies is very important. One of the earliest theologies that offered a different take on Christology is the liberation theology that was born in the context of the South American context of dictatorship and also severe economic poverty. The context of military dictatorship and the socio-economic inequalities provided a very important location to reimagine what Christ means in that particular context. So Christology is marked by its concern for liberation of the world's people from unjust economic or social inequalities. There are three levels of meaning to the term liberation in this context. The political liberation of the oppressed peoples and social classes and people's liberation in the course of history. And thirdly, the liberation from sin as a condition of life that affects the very communion of all people within God. So the fundamental question of liberation Christology is not just about doing theology, but liberation itself. So the wider preoccupation of liberation theology was not only to occupy the center, but create the space for the poor, the people who are disenfranchised. It is also a challenge to connect the mystery of God revealed in Christ to the lived experience of people and their humanity. So Christ becomes a kind of permanent antithesis to the thesis of existing society where they are despised, where they are excluded, where Christ becomes a different frame of reference. So Christ is in many cases in this context is deprivatized by being interpreted as the radical social critique of existing systems of oppression. So Christ is seen as the great refuser who reacts against every existing social form. Jesus becomes the source of freedom for human beings in history, both in the past and in the present. And also liberation Christology offers Jesus as a revolutionary and very importantly, the cross symbolizes the freedom and independence possible in Jesus Christ for the crucified people. The cross as, as a historical necessary symbol becomes a component of love. It's part of the historical fullness what God was pleased to offer in the person of Jesus Christ to redeem the fallen humanity. Archbishop Romero identifies Jesus and the oppressed, the people, very closely, where he says, Jesus Christ, the liberator, is so closely identified with the people that interpreters of scripture cannot tell whether Yahweh's servant proclaimed by Isaiah is the suffering people or Christ who comes to redeem us. In this context, the mission of Jesus was to liberate human beings from the trap of justifying unjust, inhuman situations in the social con consciousness. So during his day, Jesus was always in solidarity with the oppressed people and performed miracles out of compassion. He transformed the unjust structures. So liberation Christology within the South American context projects this Jesus Christ who is able to critique, challenge the oppressive systems and offer a way for people to examine their own life 
but reimagine their context so that they can become liberated. So liberation Christology in many ways teaches the importance of Christian praxis in the society. It's not simply an academic interest but has clear significance in the lived reality of people. Christ is seen as this great liberator. Jesus as the revolutionary. The cross as the symbol of freedom and new life. Therefore, liberation Christology paved the path to challenge any dominant systems through the person of Jesus Christ because he was seen as the great revolutionary within the Gospels and liberation theology more broadly provides that identification which is crucial for the emancipation of people and their life. Dalit Christology is part of the wider Dalit theological reflection. Dalit is a term that is used within the Indian context to refer to people who used to be called untouchable or the polluted. And Dalit theology emerged from that particular context. Building on the influence of liberation theology, Dalit theology in broad context provides the ways to enable Dalits who are religiously and traditionally considered as polluting were never allowed within any religious space. Therefore, when they became Christians, there was a new freedom for them to express their own understanding of what it means to be Christian. In that extent, what it means to be human. Because they were dehumanized, they weren't considered as equals. So Dalit theology provides a very important framework for millions of Dalits in Indian context to take up ownership and the freedom to imagine about God and what it means to be human within that context. Within the broader context of Dalit theology, Dalit Christology becomes a critical vehicle of understanding their own place and their identity within Jesus Christ. So Christology within Dalit theology occupies a very important place because it was through the pain, pathos and the experience of Jesus Christ that Dalits are able to identify their own pain and suffering. And it is in this identification of pain and pathos that they come to experience God. Christology in Dalit perspective is contextually expressing the life experiences of Dalits in relation with Jesus Christ. So the purpose of Christology in Dalit perspective is to interpret the relevance of Jesus Christ to the lives of Dalits. It was constructed to be liberative to the Dalits and to the life and their uh, life situation. As an oppressed mindset, an oppressed community, identifying with Jesus Christ becomes a critical vehicle through which they can reimagine their life. So Dalit Christological expression could be broadly categorized into three uh, uh, contexts. First, the recognition of Jesus Christ, the suffering servant, through whom the pain and suffering becomes the context within which they are able to identify their own lives. And Jesus Christ as a Dalit, in so to speak, in the terminology of those who are despised. So idea of Jesus as a Dalit becomes a very important paradigm for Dalits to identify. And Jesus Christ as the Messiah is the one who liberates, not simply as the suffering servant, but one who is able to transform and redeem the lives of the oppressed. So Dalit Christology finds its foundations in the suffering servant image of Jesus Christ, but does not end there, but 
ends in the process of liberation and fullness of life that is possible in Jesus Christ. The meaning of the identification and participation by God through Jesus, the suffering servant, is critical in terms of defining Dalit Christology. The messianic identity of Jesus, who will liberate them, free them, and give them a new life, becomes a critical lens. Dalit's use of image of Jesus Christ is also very important. The visual and the physical connection that they are able to have with this Jesus becomes a very important vehicle through which they are able to experience liberation. Moreover, these images do not remain as images, but actually becomes lived expressions of their own life. So Dalit Christology functions in a way that is accessible, that is meaningful and relevant to the lives of people and their context. So Dalits who encounter social, political, cultural exclusion and dehumanization find fullness of life in Jesus Christ. And Dalit Christology builds on several examples and metaphors in the Gospels to build their narrative of what it means to be the despised, who can become the source of God's love and redemption. So in many ways, Dalit Christology transforms the lives of people. So it's not simply ends with the identification, but it leads to transformation. Therefore, Dalit Christology within the wider Dalit theology paradigm becomes a very important vehicle. So without the identification of Jesus Christ, God's presence in Dalit communities becomes difficult. Therefore, Christological understanding of Dalits becomes very important in terms of opening up their understanding of how they perceive God within that particular context. And of course, this Dalit Christology is not simply a cultural challenge, but also becomes a very equally political uh, metaphor, so to speak, because Dalit's situation is not simply a socio-economic reality, but also a political liberation. So therefore, building on the liberation Christology, Dalit Christology combines the cultural sensitivities of Christological understanding and also the political ramifications of that cultural understanding. Therefore, when Dalits seek freedom and liberation, they are able to combine their cultural locatedness with the hope of political liberation. Therefore, Dalit Christology brings together different elements of social, cultural, political, and economic realities in order to shape their own uh, 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 future in, in shaping their new life that is possible in Jesus Christ. Therefore, Dalit Christology is at the heart of Dalit theology in understanding God's redemption for humanity. Minjung Christology. Minjung is a term that is used within the Korean context to refer to people who are socially, economically treated outside the main social system. Especially during the Japanese occupation, many Koreans were reduced to Minjung status. Minjung simply meant in that context people who are socially ostracized and economically treated as non-existent. Therefore, they are excluded outside into the social system. Minjung are those people who have suffered from exploitation, poverty, and socio-political oppression and cultural repression throughout the ages. And of course, this goes back several centuries 
even before the Japanese occupation. Minjung people, according to theologians, know the pain of dehumanization. Their lives have been rooted in the age-old experience of suffering and the presence of their experience of exclusion even in today's context. They have been treated as non-beings by their rulers. A, a provocative Christology from the Minjum perspective is to recognize again and identify with Jesus Christ as the Minjum. And what that means is that the people who are politically oppressed, socially alienated, economically exploited and excluded from intellectual and cultural development becomes the collective identity of Jesus Christ. Minjum Christology makes an effort to develop a descriptive and a relatable perspective of Jesus Christ as opposed to an abstract and idealistic version of Jesus Christ. So the attitudes of Jesus towards the most excluded and vulnerable creates a paradigm that Minjung are the people that Jesus is able to identify and most importantly also the fact that Jesus always identified with the people, the excluded. So Jesus' compassion towards people and Jesus' uh, how he taught and equipped people to be fully visible and present. And Jesus spent time, according to Menjum Christology, with sinners, tax collectors, the sick, who are often identified and excluded for who they are. And so Menjum Christology in this context suggests that Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God to those who are excluded. Significantly, Menjum Christology identifies the wider people as Minjum, the people who are very often described in the Gospels as the crowd, the people, are the Minjum, the people who are very often undefined, unidentified as individuals, as communities. But here also Minjum theology operates in such a way that it is the same crowd that also betrayed Jesus Christ, the reality of the crowd where the reality of Jesus Christ meets. So the Minjum consciousness of messianic politics of self-transcendence becomes very important. Why Minjum Christology lays it out how very often the self-consciousness of messianic politics can be very self-contradictory. Therefore, it warns and critiques that you need to be very careful not to essentialize how Jesus Christ is understood within that particular context, especially within the context of modern ideologies. The oppressed, according to Minjum Christology, were not simply a channel to help our understanding of Jesus, but rather Jesus was a channel to help our understanding of the oppressed. And this is a very significant distinction that Minjum Christology makes. Jesus cried, he suffered, and he suffered much like the Minjum. He suffered like those who are excluded socially and economically. Jesus did not come to be served. Minjum Christology claims that he came to serve. And this is a very crucial identification for the Menjum context because many of the Menjum people are those who are constantly subservient and forced to serve others in a social context. So Jesus was very much at the heart of identifying and opening our understanding of Menjum people. Therefore, Menjum Christology does a very important contribution to the wider Christological understanding that by looking at Jesus, the oppressed, the suffering servant, we open up into the reality of understanding the lives 
of those who are excluded. Therefore, Minjum Christology plays a very significant role in broadening our understanding of what it means to experience exclusion and social cultural exclusion in that where Jesus Christ becomes the channel through which we identify and recognize the people who are very often not defined or identified or recognized. African Christologies. The wide African context with very diverse linguistic and cultural patterns offers a phenomenal diversity in terms of how we understand Jesus Christ within those contexts. Before we understand the wider reality of diversity within the African context, two important aspects need to be understood within this uh, location. One is, of course, the transatlantic slavery that shaped much of the understanding of Christianity. And secondly, the missionary Christianity that shaped a, a broad range of Christian realities. And the transatlantic slavery that was very much prevalent even before Christianity came to many parts of the African continent provided a way, a lens through which how Jesus Christ was understood. And very often the challenge that we face in contemporary context is the effort by many African theologians to unpack those images and re construct a very affirming image of Jesus Christ that reflects the lived realities of many Africans in the global context. And of course the missionary Christianity with a very Eurocentric understanding also continues to play an important role how Jesus Christ was perceived. So the relationship between Christ and the African context is an important question that is raised within African Christologies. If Christ was to appear as the answer to the questions that Africans are asking, what would he look like? And this is a very important question many theologians raise. Begin to interpret the Christian faith in terms of that reflection of identity of culture and also belief within the traditional belief systems in, in the wide African context. This particular questioning laid the foundation for African Christologies of indigenization, of enculturation and also of liberation within that particular context. What that means is that as a result of questioning missionary Christologies as a way of questioning the kind of images that were circulated during the transatlantic slavery, the ancestral Christological questions that were developed within the African religious belief system assumes a very important place. Jesus Christ as an ancestor who, will, who needs to be worshipped in that pattern who belongs to the experience, not necessarily uh, one of oppression and exclusion, but of identification. It is an approach that seeks to completely identify Christ with African Christians by treating Christ under the category of ancestor. Kwame Bediako, one of the foremost theologians to emerge out of the African context, says the heart of the encounter of the good news with our context is Christology. The significance of our faith in Jesus Christ, crucified and risen for our existence in the world, becomes the defining point. So the dialectical between culture and context and scripture are at the heart of African Christologies. And the very fact that there are multiple Christologies within this context assumes that there are different ways of looking at Jesus Christ 
in different parts of the African continent. So African theologies more broadly approaches enculturation and liberation as a key themes within the broader context. So enculturation or contextualization is defined as the effort to take seriously the specific context of each human group and person on its own terms and in all its dimensions, cultural, religious, social and political and economic. And of course, add to that the discernment of what gospel says in that particular context. So that the particular needs and hopes of people in that particular context is addressed and they are given a sense of hope. So African Christologies in their diversity is a, is a, is a pattern of theological reflection from the African situatedness. So Christian faith and its countenance of the powers so to be described not in a soteriological sense or in terms of adherence to rubrics of otherworldly thinking but located within the traditions and the traditional beliefs of each of those contexts. One of the key features of Christianity in the African context is that it is significantly influenced by traditional belief systems and spiritual practices. Much of the Christian religious practices are embedded within the traditional belief system. From several anthropological and uh, uh, field works that has been created um, across the African context is the idea of how various mythologies, various views of the world became the sources of doing Christology. The epistemological, the ways of knowing aspects of belief system are that the invisible world of divine beings is intrinsically connected with the visible phenomenal world. Hence, both aspects, the visible and the less visible world, have significant impact on the mundane lives of human beings. Human beings seek to change, remedy and shape their own world in that particular context. So the divine beings become very critical components of recreating a new world. So if you look at similar context across diverse locations in Africa, this engagement of the visible world and the invisible world becomes manifested in different ways. For instance, if you look at the Ghanaian context, very often you will encounter Jesus' names on the shop names. So Jesus is a bread of life, grocery for example. And also Jesus as a bread of life becomes a very important mechanism through which people are able to identify. Or Jesus loves fashion is a, is a, is a shop that you can see where various occasions is very much part of that cultural context. And this list goes on and you will see several shop names, you know, for example, Divine Connection phone shop or God's Finger fitting shop or God's Miracle drinking spot or Dry Bones Shall Live Again haircut, Consuming Fire Fast Foods or Hotel Messiah. These are all maybe very interesting in terms of names but they are all very much shaped within that context where their lives and their belief systems are very much in conversation. The Christian proprietors of these shops are very often explained that there are very specific reasons. It not only appeals to people that there is a Christian understanding for this particular shop, but also opens up a conversation for people to participate in living out their own belief in that way. So very often, Jesus Christ is shaped within that particular context. So what that brings us is the idea of enculturation, but also a sense of ownership. And this goes back to, particularly in the context of South Africa, 
And when people were embracing a new way of life and fighting against apartheid, Jesus Christ became a very important tool through whom they were able to imagine a new life. And imagine this is the context where the European settlers were dominating their lives, where the images of Jesus Christ that was brought in by the missionaries becomes transformed as source of liberation, as source of new life for people like Nelson Mandela, Bishop Tutu. They built that understanding of new life that is possible in Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus Christ and the Christology within the African context opens up both in real life, not only in, in sense of providing agency, but also hope and aspirations for a new life that is very much at the heart of their Christian belief. Therefore, traditional belief systems are not done away with, but rather the traditional belief systems are very much shaped their understanding of Jesus Christ, not only as an ancestor, but as a liberator who can provide new life, not only in terms of political and cultural life, but also lives that are very simple in a street. Postcolonial Christology. Postcolonialism is a discourse of resistance to any subsequent related projects of dominance. Postcolonial subversive analysis then should intend to diverse forms of domination, not only in politics, but also in language, culture, economics, and religion. How is it possible for the formerly colonized, oppressed, subjugated, subaltern people to transform the symbol of Christ, a symbol that has been used to justify colonization and domination, into a symbol that affirms life, dignity, and freedom? And this is the fundamental question at the heart of postcolonial Christology. The task of a critical theologian in this tradition is not so much to provide answers, but to raise new questions that have not been asked before, or to point to new avenues of thought that may have been overlooked or suppressed. Following liberation theology, post-colonial theology more broadly follows the trifocal critique of the oppressive powers of state, economy, and culture. So the challenge that is posed before any post-colonial theologian is how the church has been involved in, or involved, colluded with the dominating, subjugating powers, how it even benefited from oppressive colonization. The transformation of the oppressed people within that context requires transforming those fundamental structures of oppression and domination. So the critical perspective for postcolonial Christology is to provide a critical corrective to that very framing in search of a renewed synthesis, in search of a renewed analysis of those critical factors that dominate and subjugate. So the task of postcolonial Christology is not only to recover Jesus from a colonial articulation, but also to explore what it means to experience dislocation and also to live in between different cultures. So the question of cultural integrity, the question about cultural hybridity becomes very important within the postcolonial Christological questions, where Jesus Christ would be defined in multiple uh, ways, in multiple alliances, where the relevant aspects of spiritual needs, but also contemporary challenges that are brought on by national identities and also political affiliations. So postcolonial Christology provides a very broad 
spectrum to question any normative colonizing definitions of Jesus Christ. And also, postcolonial Christology offers a sense of recontextualizing the meaning of the cross itself. Because cross was seen as a source of violence, source of pain and subjugation. How can that be redeemed as a source of hope and new life? Going beyond the compassion and the pain pathos and the identification of Jesus Christ, the cross becomes a potential symbol of new life because Jesus Christ as someone who was colonized was able to challenge those oppressive forces and provide new life. Because Jesus Christ himself was subversive as the gospels narrate. So post-colonial Christology for millions of people who live in a post-colonial context becomes a vehicle through which decolonization takes place. Jesus and the cross as embodiment of subversiveness, of decolonizing, embraces the transcendence that is possible in the pain and suffering of Jesus Christ. In many ways, Jesus exemplified a praxis of subversion. By refusing to succumb to the logic of victimhood, in the name of relational power and unconditional love, Jesus Christ was able to redeem and provide a new life. The cross, therefore, is about the transcendence of domination, overcoming of violence, putting behind the subjugation. And Jesus and Christ himself becomes a hybrid concept. In a post-colonial context where you have multiple identities to deal with, Jesus, the historical person and the Christ of faith, becomes vehicles through which people can identify their own hybridized state. What that brings us together is the way post-colonial Christology opens up a new way of embracing what it means to be Christians in a post-colony. And this opens up a whole new meaning and purpose for Christians who live in colonized, dominated and subjugated locations to embrace new life that is possible in Jesus Christ. And post-colonial Christology also opens up new ways of defining what it means to be human in those contexts. Therefore, post-colonial Christology in many locations becomes a culmination of their quest for liberation, a culmination of their struggle for life. And these aspects cannot be isolated in a vacuum, but they need to be seen in conjunction with one another. Christology as a discipline that examines our understanding of Jesus Christ and the relevance of Jesus Christ within our Christian journey across the global context provides rich and, and diverse textures for us to link and relate with. From the previous examples of Dalit Christology, Minjung Christology, Liberation Christology and the African Christologies and postcolonial Christologies provided us a breadth of examples that captures how diverse people's perceptions of Jesus Christ from their own locations. Therefore, the question that arises how we can imagine this rich tapestry of perceptions of Jesus Christ can be located and understood within the global context. Therefore, the common themes that emerge from these observations are that the idea of existential realities defining our perceptions of Jesus Christ and also how those existential realities goes on to define and to a certain extent determine our ontological understanding of Jesus Christ. 
And of course, they are not limited to the historical Jesus himself, but the lived experiences of people. The second element theme that emerges across these strands is the idea of enculturation. How we understand Jesus Christ within a particular context, within, within a particular given location, and how we can richly reimagine Jesus that makes sense in particular context. And of course, the third theme that emerges right across these traditions is the idea of liberation, transformation, transcending the present context. It's not just about the existential reality, but the deep quest for transcending those existential realities. How Jesus Christ becomes a channel through which we are able to reimagine a whole new life. And of course, the idea of decolonial, redeeming, recovering Jesus from those colonial definitions and providing a new way of relating with not the oppressive structures where Jesus Christ was very often used, but as a source of liberation and hope. And this opens up a whole new avenue as understanding Jesus Christ as an inclusive paradigm. No one is excluded from this understanding and perception of Jesus Christ. So finally, the context not only provides a rich variety, but also opens up to the understanding of hybrid understanding of Jesus Christ. There is no one right way of understanding because the diverse context and the realities of people, they open up new ways of relating with Jesus Christ from those contexts. So hybridity becomes very much at the heart of our Christologies. So the margins that becomes a live context which defines very often the normative understanding of Jesus Christ provides a significant challenge to how we imagine Jesus Christ in the global context. The challenges about power, challenges about structure and how we can rethink a more inclusive, contextually relevant perceptions of Jesus Christ. So the question that we would leave you with is the question of how do we see Jesus and what this Jesus means to us? Hello, we've just watched Anderson Jeremiah's video on Christology and I'm here with two of my colleagues ready to talk about it. I'm Mike Higton from the University of Durham where I teach doctrine and I'll ask my colleagues to introduce themselves. So, Sarah. I'm uh, Sarah Brush from Ripon College Cudston, a tutor in pastoral theology, not a tutor in doctrine and Christology, so this is going to be fascinating for me. Anderson. I'm Anderson Jeremiah and I'm a, a senior lecturer in uh, uh, Lancaster University. Thank you. I wonder if I could start with one question about your video. How do you see the interplay between these uh, rich voices from many different contexts seeing Jesus from all sorts of different perspectives and the historical Jesus in the Gospels. How do those two sides of the conversation relate? Thank you. I, I think that's it. What I try to share in this video is, is precisely the tension between the, the kind of historical Jesus and how that historical Jesus was encountered in different parts of the world. Um, for all sorts of reasons, I think when Christianity began to um, expand across the globe um, in the last 2000 years, um, it was primarily through the person of uh, Jesus that that message of, of, of God's love for the world was taken across. So the, the primary encounter of many people uh, with Christianity was through the person of Jesus Christ and of course when they encountered Jesus Christ they also encountered the whole range of theological understanding that came with the person of uh, Jesus. So what I try to share in this particular video is to kind of how can we 
experience both the historical Jesus that we meet in the scriptures and in the uh, traditions that has been um, handed over, uh, but also how we listen to people encountering that Jesus through different traditions um, uh, with, a, with a small T, not the capital T, but how they have been brought to them. Uh, and very often the channel through which this Jesus has been brought to these different contexts across the world were different. Um, and what I tried to capture is that how this both uh, giving and receiving of that message of Jesus is, is very much the, the, the basis and the framework within which Christology is understood in these different contexts. Thank you. Anderson, you spoke, spoke about the um, inculturation that happens mm. in some of these places where the local culture impacts mm. the Christologies that might be coming out. Um, and I was particularly interested when you were talking about Ghana, because um, for me it kind of got to an interesting place there of, of matching that historical Jesus and, and their concept of Jesus. The Jesus loves fashion shop, <laughs> for me, really, it kind of just made me think of, you know, consider the lilies. I'm not sure Jesus loves fashion in that sense. And, and so how do we deal with that when some of the sort of the local cultural influence on Christology, where do we sort of assess how that's going against something that we might think is actually a, a clean understanding, a true understanding of Christ? Uh, and how important is it to keep to a certain core of Christology? That is one of the big challenges because um, as I was saying earlier uh, it is it is the tension between what is provided by the scriptures the historical mm. person of Jesus but also how that Jesus is lived and experienced by people mm. um, from my experience and from my research and from my lived encounters in these places what I found fascinating was that what makes sense to people yeah. uh, and very often and this uh, that question takes me back to uh, the scripture itself particularly to the Gospels if you look at Jesus and his own teachings very often he used the metaphors and the parables to speak to particular contexts and he often used those frameworks those words those analogies and the examples that he gave, he spoke from those contexts which people are familiar with. And, you know, the questions about uh, a sower uh, or, or a shepherd or the imagery of, uh, a, 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 you know, uh, someone who is catching fish. Mm -hmm. All this imagery speaks to a particular lived context, even within a small geographical location. If now, if uh, I apply that to a very modern uh, uh, context, uh, you know, you gave the example of uh, Ghana, because when I was uh, uh, living there in, in, in Cape Coast and when I was talking to these different uh, groups of people, uh, it was very real to them. Mm -hmm. It was very real in a sense that it makes sense that their, uh, uh, their life situation is the very context where Jesus is located. Mm. Jesus is not someone who is far removed, part of, uh, uh, you know, 2000 years ago, lived in Judea, but Jesus is someone who is very much located where they are. The language might be quite uh, uh, difficult for us to get through, but the essence, the experience, the sense they are trying to communicate is primarily that this Jesus is meaningful and relevant to them where they are, mm -hmm. not someone who is far removed in the past. Therefore, uh, the tension between, well, here is a pure understanding of Jesus Christ, as opposed to this somehow made up understanding of Jesus Christ, is something that we possibly as, as kind of formal theologians have to get over, yeah. but actually see the Gospels themselves, the very fact that we have four different Gospels, mm. have different stories to tell about Jesus, that recognizes the fact that it's all about the encounters and how we capture that. But at the same time, give credence to the experience of people and, and how that allows us to see different images 
and different perspectives of Jesus. Because you spoke about the hybridity, didn't you, of those different perspectives. And, and I think that's really good to, to remind us that we already have that within scripture, that there are those four different accounts of Jesus. I think for me, it was the Jesus loves fashion, just, just <laughs> because I think it, for me, it conflicted with a sense of, um, I don't think Jesus should be commercialized in that way. But I think what you're saying is from the perspective, that's not what that was for. Mm. It was just, Jesus is so part of my life that he's in the name of my shop. Mm. Yeah, okay, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Have you ever come across a response to Jesus in some other context or culture where you've felt you, you had to have the kind of reaction that Sarah yeah. had, where, you, where you've had to effectively say, no, something's gone wrong here. This is a betrayal mm. in mm. some deep way. Absolutely. Uh, even within my Indian context, uh, there's a long tradition of comparing Jesus to Krishna, Lord Krishna, mm. uh, because they are of the same, uh, because they both teach about, talk about ethical living, uh, because you have in the Bhagavad Gita, in the uh, Vedic texts, uh, you have Lord Krishna, one of the important uh, uh, gods within uh, the pantheon of uh, Hinduism, as someone who's holding uh, uh, those ethical teachings uh, very important. But also there is that other side of Lord Krishna who is very playful. He had a lot of uh, uh, girlfriends, he had lots of uh, uh, playful portrayal of that God within the Hindu tradition. So I had to, when I first encountered these comparisons between Jesus Christ and Lord Krishna as, oh, they are essentially the same, I had a similar reaction. <laughs> no, 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 Jesus is, you know, different from Krishna. But what I was trying to do then is to try and uh, um, distinguish not to kind of uh, uh, reduce the importance of those comparative lenses, but at the same time, how we can have distinctions that allows Jesus Christ to be accepted despite a different location, different cultural context, different uh, uh, framing of uh, this particular person as opposed to Lord Krishna who is culturally developed. Uh, it is about keeping those distinctions but at the same time enabling people to see the, the similarities, yeah. not to collapse them or they are same, one and the same, therefore we can, uh, we can uh, follow that model. Because again, working within a, a, you know, my primary theological context was India, where it is perfectly comfortable uh, uh, to see anywhere you travel in India that all gods are kept uh, uh, side by side. There is no internal contradiction. So they don't mind worshipping uh, five different gods at simultaneously. Uh, but at the same time, they are not necessarily collapsing all of them together and say, this is one big mush of a god, but rather different gods play different roles within the Hindu context. My resistance to that uh, uh, comparison was that, Oh, please don't put Jesus along with that range of God as just doing something simple. Mm. But actually, what Jesus has shown in his life is that actually Jesus could be more than just one God. Mm. He has allowed people themselves to realize God's presence in each one of them. Instead of just following him, we can actually become the presence of God in the local context. So for me, it is about identifying the distinction, but also enabling uh, Jesus Christ as a lens to see the culture. Um, one of the points I picked up from the video that I really, really found fascinating was that in our Western culture, quite often we identify with the disciples. We think of ourselves as one of the 12, you know, in our privilege, we think that's where we are. But you spoke about those, and I, I can't remember if it was the Dalit or the Korean context, where they identify with the crowd. Um, what mm. impact do you think that has on us as Western Christians who might not have thought that before um, and, and the difference? So what can we learn from that, thinking of ourselves not as one of the big players, but as one of the crowd? I think it's what I tried to offer in that particular um, section is that I think there is, there's always this tendency to limit uh, Jesus Christ if we can use that as, a, as a, a lens to look at our lived experience 
all these different um, Christologies, what they offer is that they enable us to see it's not just about individuals, but also the communities within which this story is lived and experienced, mm -hmm. which means that we don't necessarily look at Jesus as an individual or the disciples as individuals, mm -hmm. but actually how other characteristics, other characters in this story come about. Mm -hmm. And it is in Minjum uh, theology yeah. that very often that Jesus Christ was very attentive to the crowd, the yeah. time that he spends with the crowd. So the crowd by itself becomes a very important character in the narrative of Jesus Christ. So Minjum theologians use that as a very powerful tool and say the crowd which is not named, everything is collapsed into that identity, Jesus gives importance to that crowd. And that becomes a very important tool to, to recognize that actually Jesus recognizes the crowd which is not identified, which is not named, which doesn't have any significance. But Jesus gives importance to that insignificant crowd, unnamed crowd, the invisible crowd. Therefore, Minjin theology, for example, says that that's where Jesus Christ becomes powerful because Minjin as a people in the Korean context are invisible, are voiceless, or uh, they are the people who are completely uh, excluded. Yeah. And Jesus gives importance to us. Therefore, I think it is, it is about enabling this creativity uh, in different contexts and Jesus Christ becomes a very powerful interpretive tool mm -hmm. and that's what I find fascinating in different contexts that uh, to a large extent because of the incarnational nature of Jesus Christ it by itself allows for enculturation mm -hmm. and by itself allows it for multiple interpretation as opposed to having one understanding of God and other aspects that we encounter in Christian theology. Christology is a more open mm. space for people to engage with the stories and the narratives because people bring their own meaning and interpretation to it. Thank you. I wonder if I could pick up and respond just to that last point. Mm. So listening to you, um, as someone who's a doctrinal theologian, I think what I hear there is that this is in some ways driven by or, or involves quite a high Christology. There's this conviction that God has spoken to the world in Jesus of Nazareth, but it's the God of the whole world who has spoken in Jesus of Nazareth. And this, this word spoken in Jesus is audible everywhere, in every context. So every group of people can mm. engage with, encounter, hear, learn from this word and can do so directly, not in a way which is mediated by lots mm. of mm. other steps, but there's a sort of direct encounter by the spirit with what's mm. spoken mm. in Jesus. Is, is that fair? Is there a sort of something like a high vision of, of uh, Christology powering this kind of approach to Christology? It's absolutely, if I could um, respond to that question by saying, what really shapes much of the uh, uh, Christianity in the global context is, is the work of the Spirit. And Pentecost becomes a very powerful metaphor where when the Spirit comes upon those who are gathered, they all spoke in different languages and people understood them. And much of the expansion of Christianity, particularly in the last three, four centuries, has been through that charismatic giving of, uh, of the Spirit, but primarily understood through Jesus. Therefore, there is this idea that Jesus empowers this God-given spirit powered through Jesus empowers different communities in different places and it, therefore that vision is definitely part of that process that it's not something that is just happens out of the blue but actually it 
encourages, enables people in their own location to tell their story, which is perfectly acceptable within the story of God speaking through Jesus in the world.